So yeah, welcome everybody. And uh, I think it's a seven or five. So should we wait for two, two, three more minutes and then we can start. We are waiting for other participants to join. Till then, we can, well, till then we first, can- uh, Just let me thank you for inviting me. I, oh. I, uh, I appreciate the invitation. It's a pleasure. All right, those participants who don't know me, my name is Bimal Mishra and I am Associate Professor at IIT Gandhinagar, Civil Engineering and Earth Sciences disciplines, two disciplines. I'm co-convener of Center of Sustainable Development. Okay, and uh, this seminar series is our sustainability seminar series. So roughly about two and a half years back, IIT Gandhinagar started a center known as Kiran C. Patel Center for Sustainable Development with a generous donation from Dr. Kiran C. Patel based in Florida. And uh, we thought like we should start a seminar series and uh, connect with a wider audience. So center has mandate to work on uh, three or four key areas. Climate change is of course one of them. Public health is the other one water sustainability is the third one and then the clean energy is the fourth one so these are four pillars um, in the center where we all are working and uh, under this sustainability seminar series we invite roughly once in a month eminent speakers to speak on any of these four themes and uh, so Matt, there have been number of registrations for this. Uh, so I, I hope many people will join us today evening. And uh, so let me introduce formally Professor Matt Huber. So Professor Matthew Huber is a professor uh, in the Earth Sciences Department of Purdue University. He is also Associate Director of Purdue Climate Change Research Center. Uh, and uh, he is serving as Editor-in-Chief of Paleoceanography and Paleoclimatology. So Matt has been doing phenomenal work in terms of paleoclimate, climate change, uh, climate change impacts on uh, human health, especially heat stress. And, uh, uh, and I mean, if you look at his publications, you will find out certainly more that what exciting stuff he has been writing. So today he will be speaking on something like linking the past warm climate and then what we can learn from them and why it is important to learn from the past climate uh, for better understanding that what is going to happen uh, in the future. So Matt, did I miss anything? Uh, no, I can. I can start whenever you're ready. I guess the only thing I wanted to say was that I, I, I'd like to try, if we can, uh, that if people have questions while I'm talking, um, that they should ask them and you know I can stop what I'm doing and try and answer them. So um, I don't know the best way to do that. Um, it's not always, maybe yeah. you can monitor the questions, maybe. How we do this, like first you can finish your talk. Audience can feed their questions in Q&A box and uh, while you are speaking. And then we will have a discussion session at the end of your talk. So, so that helps everybody, right? And that also help us to monitor that which are um, important questions that needs to be discussed out of many other questions all questions are important but we certainly cannot discuss all of them because of the time limit and so uh, with these words i mean it's a seven or ten matt you will have whatever time you need roughly 40 to 40 minutes to one hour and then after your talk is over we can have like 15 and 20 minutes discussion with the people who are interested in asking questions interacting with you and uh, uh, and I'm sure that will happen. So Matt, over to you. You can share your slides now, and we can start. Okay. Can you see my screen? 
Yes. Terrific. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first, let me just go ahead, apologize ahead of time if my dog creates a problem. <laughs> uh that that could always happen she's a um 45 50 kilo dog and um she goes chasing things sometimes so if i have to stop in the middle that's what's going on um it's my pleasure to be able to give you this talk um i've been working with vmol for uh you know actually quite a while now since he was a graduate student here at purdue uh it's been a, my great pleasure to do so um and my talk will cover a number of areas and i hope to be able to help you see the unity of climate through time uh, on the other hand i have so many different things that i could talk about sometimes when i give versions of this talk i can go for two or three hours and that's horrible for everybody so um so i'm going to uh try and hit the highlights of some of the connections that I see across time. And I would be happy uh, to provide more information and fill in gaps uh, if you have any questions at the end. And I can, I can talk for a lot more time on any one particular topic. This is uh, the kind of science I do is a collaborative endeavor. It requires people with expertise in many different disciplines. And that's one of the joys of it is I'm constantly learning, I'm constantly interacting with new people, and um, it, you make a lot of friends along the way. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to have such great colleagues. So, <clears throat> um, I've been doing this now for about 30 years, and the questions that motivated me when I was 19 years old and I, and I started working on this topic uh, are still the same questions that motivate me today. I've just taken them in, in a variety of directions. So, uh, you know, as it turns out, a lot of these questions are central to climate change debates uh, more generally, not just my own interest. But I, I boil things down essentially to three things. So what sets the global mean surface temperature of the planet through time? You know, what are the general processes? Um, what sets the temperature gradient between the equator and pole? That's a very important issue, which, which bears on two related issues. One is polar amplification of climate change, and one is tropical thermostats, which limit tropical climate change, if any, uh, if those exist. And then finally, you know, the only reason why, frankly, I care about any of this is, does it affect life? If none of this affected life, it was just sort of a, a math problem, that'd be great, but I wouldn't be interested. So um, those three themes essentially unify all of the work that I've done for 30 years, even though sometimes I'm working on the world 60 million years ago, and sometimes I'm working on one individual place 100 years from now. But it's always the same questions that drive me. So I'll talk about several of those today, but I won't be able to talk about everything. But as you start trying to address those three questions, you realize you're, you're pulling on a thread and then the thread starts unraveling and, and it's made up of more threads. And uh, so um, what you find is when you, when you try and answer those three questions, you end up with this huge ball of twine uh, where everything is connected to everything else. And if you pull on one part of it you, and you follow that string, you go to a whole nother part of it. So if you start working on coral reef bleaching and tropical cyclones and sea level change and ice caps melting and flooding and the monsoon and heat stress. Um, so, you know, everything is connected and that's really the beauty of thinking about these big problems. As you realize you can tackle them from many different angles and you see the unity of science. Um, so I, I, I must admit, I, I, I love my job because I never get bored. Um, now, on the issue of climate sensitivity, this is one that has been one that people have argued about for uh, more than 100 years. 
Um, and it's often phrased as what is the equilibrium surface temperature change uh, due to a doubling of CO2. It could be framed in other ways, but that's one of them. And people have been trying to estimate the value of climate sensitivity again for a long time. And there has seemed to be a seemingly irreducible range of uncertainty there of somewhere between one and a half to four and a half degrees of warming for a doubling. And uh, there are many different approaches uh, to trying to, to narrow that range. One of them that has been applied is using data and data model comparison from past climates to see can we somehow inform or narrow uh, that poorly constrained range? And you know, just to give you an idea of how poorly constrained it is, um, you know, you know something is is uncertain when you don't just have a histogram of of possible values, but uh, as you have here, 19 different histograms. These are 19 different studies where people have tried to estimate a value of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And they all have basically the same shape. And there are very good reasons why they have that particular shape where there's sort of a sharp cutoff at low values and a big fat tail at high values. But nevertheless, they all, um, you know, they, 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 there's a lot of uncertainty in this parameter and it seems to never go away. It is answer changing for how much you need to do in terms of limiting emissions um, if you want to say reach a two degree global temperature target, uh, like the Paris Agreement, it's it's answer changing for that kind of decision making what the value of sensitivity is. You get a completely different set of policies if ECS is two or if it's four. And since right now we think it's around three ish, again with these big error bars, you know it would be very important to see if past climates where we know something about CO2 and we know something about temperature if they could reduce the spread. And that's where me personally and on a large part of the field have devoted uh, quite a lot of time for the past 20 some odd years. Um, there was a recent review paper uh, and also this is covered in the most recent um, IPCC report, um, how those estimates have changed. Uh, the recent review paper by uh, Tierney et al. would be a good place to look if you um, want to know kind of the, the latest consensus view on those things. I'm gonna just talk rather briefly about my own contribution in this area. But first I wanna indicate that this has been on people's mind for a very long time. Oh, there's my dog. Uh, if you go back to 1896 to Arrhenius, the person who really um, laid down uh, a firm framework for thinking about the greenhouse effect, um, you know, he had already figured out uh, that you could use past climates, in this case, the Eocene, which is one of the periods of time that I study, he calls it the tertiary, um, but, and reached the conclusion that in the tertiary, which in this case, he was thinking kind of around 50 million years ago, uh, that CO2 probably was about two and a half to three times its present value. And that was associated with conditions that were much warmer than today near the poles. And he also had identified um, the CO2 and the temperature change to the last glacial maximum. He calls it the ice age, but today we would call it the last glacial maximum. Now, as it turns out, the, the value that he estimates for the temperature change in the last glacial maximum and the CO2 change is within error from what the most recent studies would indicate. And he had this figured out in 1896. And the temperature change in CO2 for the Eocene was again, very roughly speaking, within the, the, the large error bars that we have. So um, people have been thinking about this kind of issue for a long time, and I think it's uh, important to, to always benchmark what we're doing today against what we knew in 1896. Now, in more recent work, um, 
This is a, a lovely uh, recent study by Burke et al. They kind of took uh, the temperature history for the past 60 million years as seen from um, temperature records from the bottom of the ocean, and they put them within the context of modern and future change. So it's time on the left starting at 60 million years ago, uh, the sort of a stretched time axis, and it goes to 60 to 1 million years ago, and then there's a, a jump and it goes from 300 to pre-industrial, and then on the right-hand side, it starts around 1900 and goes into the future where some of those are model predictions, obviously. So, you know, you can see in a, in a graph like this, the dynamism of the climate system through time. The fact that there have been periods of time deeper in the past where there were massive increases in temperature compared to modern day. So this should tell you immediately a couple of things. One of them is the whole world doesn't die when temperatures are 10 degrees warmer than they are now or, or five degrees warmer or something like that. These are all periods of time where life was reasonably happy and um, you know, it's not the end of the world. You don't suddenly look like Venus. Um, you know, it's not, it's not completely terrible. Uh, on the other hand, there are very different climate states. So in the early part of the record where it's really warm, uh, global mean temperature is something like 10 to 15 degrees hotter than today, there was no ice. So you didn't have ice sheets at either pole and sea level was about 100 meters higher than it is today. 100 meters is a big number. We think one meter is a big number. Look at 100 meters. And uh, Antarctica did not glaciate until about 35 million years ago, which is another one of the problems that I've worked on. And that was driven mostly by changes in CO2. The Northern Hemisphere didn't have glaciation until about three and a half million years ago. So, you know, there have been major changes that were driven by natural changes in Earth's orbit, changes in greenhouse gas concentrations, movements of the continents through time. That's absolutely true. But if you look and say the past three million years, temperatures have not been significantly above today for any length of time and, and have actually spent a lot of time substantially colder than today during the long glacial intervals. And then as you look into projections into the future, you see that the kind of temperature change that we're talking about globally, while somewhat uncertain and subject to human decision-making, of course, is sort of geological, right? We are, we are making changes that are of comparable magnitude to moving the earth back 3 million years or more. And one of the things that I've been trying to do in my career as somebody who studies the climate of 50 million years ago is to try and make sure we're not sending it back to that state. That if you do that slowly enough, maybe it's a livable planet. You know, we have lots of fossil evidence that that, that world is livable, but doing it in a couple hundred years is not a good idea. You don't want to have 50 million years of climate change that happens in centuries. So, you know, this kind of sets up the context. I, uh, in my career, have, have worked on uh, the entirety of the Eocene, so from 65 million years ago to 35. Uh, more recently, I've worked on the period from 35 all the way to about 5 million years ago. So my playground, if you will, has been this part of the graph on the left-hand side where temperatures are substantially warmer than today. A lot of that was in Eocene, more recently in the Miocene and Oligocene. Uh, there's other, you know, there's a whole field of people who work on the mid-Pliocene here in um, between, you know, like around three and a half million years ago. And of course, a, a massive uh, group of people working in the glacials and in the Holocene. So, uh, there's a couple, well, there's many lessons that could be learned by studying the Eocene or the Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene. Um, there's many lessons that could possibly learn, be learned. So I'll just touch on one or two of them. Uh, and that's based on having used one modeling framework the, uh, developed by the National Center for Atmospheric Research um, for uh, more than 20 years now starting off with the very first version of their coupled model, CSM1, 
and then moving through many different versions. And through that whole process of watching model development and improvement, seeing a, a consistent set of results uh, where the models disagreed very strongly with the data, and there was something to be learned from that. And then very recently, just with the most recent version of the model, a major improvement, which tells us something rather fundamental about climate sensitivity. So I'll, I'll just very briefly walk you through that. So, uh, you know, the, the vexing issue is that for decades, since 1980, uh, when Eric Barron first started working on this, we noted, the, the people in the field noted that when you would run climate model simulations for the Eocene and you would compare them against geological data, there was a big discrepancy. So the geological data, and there are many kinds of geological data, would tell us that the poles were ice-free in the wintertime, that the, they had temperatures of 15 degrees C, and that um, the global mean surface temperature was much higher than modern. But when you would put in the kind of greenhouse gas concentration we thought that those periods had, the models tended to always be too cold. So if you have a consistent model bias, not just in the 80s, but then continues through the 90s, continues through the 2000s, which is exactly what the situation was. And it was all models. It wasn't just the NCAR model. It was all models had one consistent bias. That kind of tells you something. So the model that I was using uh, has an equilibrium climate sensitivity at the time of about two degrees per doubling on the low end. And what I found was that when I did all of the work of reproducing the, the, the past geography, the height of the mountains, the vegetation, modeling the ocean currents, doing everything I possibly could to get the Eocene right, but with a model with a sensitivity of two degrees per doubling, that I had to put in way more CO2 than we have evidence for, like 4,000 parts per million when we think there was probably only 1,400 parts per million. Now, when you have a model that kind of does the right thing, but only when you give it the wrong forcing, it tells you something is wrong with the model. So we uh, did an entire analysis uh, on the left-hand side. I'm just showing um, temperature, annual mean temperature from a series of model runs at different CO2 values trying to understand them. We did a formal feedback analysis of these. We understood the physics, but the key thing was actually this plot. So on this plot is annual mean temperature reconstructed from paleoclimate proxies. Uh, in this case, it's from leaf shape mostly, but it also includes isotope data. Um, and those are the green dots. So those are paleoclimate proxy data collected from individual fossil localities of Eocene age, 50 million years ago, roughly. And the red dots are what the model shows at that same location. So, um, and on the right-hand side is a cross plot of the reconstructed temperature versus the model temperature. Now, I don't know whether this looks good to you or not. I mean, maybe it looks okay to you. Um, but what I can say was for 30 years, people had tried to get anything that looked this good and failed. And the only way I was able to do this with the model with climate sensitivity of two was to add like four times too much CO2. If I had a model with a sensitivity of four, I could have added the right amount of CO2 to get this answer. So this was a, an example of sort of 30 years of failure followed by success, but even that success was only because I used the wrong input to get the, the right output. So it may seem like actually a string of failures and at some level it is, but this paper has been cited like 300 times. And, and the reason is because it did match with the wrong inputs, but that's because the climate sensitivity was wrong. We now know if climate sensitivity because we have later versions of the model with a higher climate sensitivity. And with those more sensitive models, we suddenly find that the models and data agree much better than they ever did before. So this is a good example of 
you can oftentimes learn more from a model and data agreeing for a long period of time, from many studies, for decades with many models, and then seeing progress, then you might learn if there was a less strong signal. A difference between a model and data is a signal and you can learn from it. In this case, it teaches us that climate sensitivity is higher than two by a substantial amount. But when we started digging into the details of our results, we saw that uh, while that answer, that take home point was valid and robust, there was a lot more to it. And this has opened um, some really interesting uh, research questions, um, which, I, which I think uh, the field has taken up on, which is that when we looked at our climate model results, we found that sensitivity was not a constant. So up until this paper, um, and then the papers that followed up on it, people kind of had this hope that climate sensitivity didn't change much through time. So therefore you could study it in the Eocene and the Miocene or whenever, and it would inform our knowledge of what sensitivity is today. We found that that is not really the case. So what we found is uh, several things, but the, the key point is uh, in this middle panel here. This is um, climate sensitivity phrased uh, not as the temperature change due to a doubling of CO2, but sort of the, the flipping that ratio over. So this is the uh, degrees of warming per watt per meter squared. A doubling is four watts per meter squared. So uh, if you see a value of 0.6 uh, on this graph, it means that if we doubled CO2, you'd have about two degrees, 2.4 degrees of warming. But when you see as global mean surface temperature changes in our simulations, different climate states, a massive jump in sensitivity. That means that warmer worlds in our model are also more sensitive to CO2, which is really interesting and really disturbing. If you wanna think about positive feedbacks and tipping points, this, this is a disturbing conclusion if it's correct and robust, because it suggests that the, even if you have a system with low sensitivity, if you warm it, it becomes more sensitive, which has more implications for thinking about the future as well. Even if today climate sensitivity is low, maybe as we warm it, climate sensitivity is nonlinear and is temperature dependent, in which case you really don't want to add much CO2. You want to stay in the linear range before the feedbacks kick in. We found that this major change in sensitivity was largely due to cloud feedbacks. Clouds are notoriously difficult to do in climate models. I would not take these results at face value as being 100% correct. They are compatible with what data that we have. And there have been subsequent studies that are following up on this more, um, but this is an area of active research. But it is fascinating that you can go back 50 million years and you know really be driving modern research questions by studying the past. I want to just give one more example of, of how you can go back into the past and say something about modern and future processes and, and just talk very briefly about global monsoons and specifically with reference to the Indo-Asian monsoon. Obviously, there's great concern about what will happen to monsoon systems in the future. And there's a huge amount of controversy on it and, and many really intelligent, hardworking uh, people putting forth data studies, modeling studies, theory, I mean, throwing everything we can at it. And um, one of the things that came out of my paleoclimate work was I spent 20 years uh, looking at paleoclimate results from models and saying, when I look at a world with different geography, different ocean currents, different CO2, you know, all the way up to 4,480 parts per million. I have the same monsoon systems in my model as I do today. And that's illustrated here uh, in the left panels where the, we, I put boxes around the modern monsoon systems on the, on the uh, bottom most part. Uh, but I have two paleoclimate simulations above them, and you can identify exactly the same monsoon systems in a world with different geography 
and much warmer temperatures. So I thought, well, maybe this is just, so I published a study on this in uh, 2013, but I thought maybe this is just a model result and has no bearing on reality. And you know, you should never just run a model and say, oh, look, I'm done. <laughs> um, so I spent about a year compiling all the paleoclimate information for the Eocene that I could find and uh, created um, this graph uh, where the circles and the triangles are paleoclimate data. And where you have an orange circle, that means the data say monsoon. And where you have green uh, triangles, that means um, ever wet. So not, not highly seasonal precipitation. And uh, I use the same color scheme for my model results. So the, where the model says there's a monsoon, it's uh, orange. And the agreement is actually rather startlingly good uh, between the models and the data, which suggests that the Indo-Asian monsoon was banging away uh, in a slightly different place, perhaps not as strong. I mean, there's all sorts of uncertainties here, but it was doing its business in a very different world. And as part of the global monsoon system, they the global monsoon system, monsoon system was functioning as well, which sends a very strong signal to me and to large part of the community, uh, which is, this has all been backed up by about 50 other studies since this paper came out, suggesting that the uh, Indo-Asian monsoon is a robust feature that does not just abruptly stop when conditions get hot or when CO2 gets high. L let me just put some notes of caution in there that, you know, uh, we're looking at a very gross feature. Does it move around? Does it change in intensity? Could it still be affected by things like aerosols? Absolutely. You know, so I'm not trying to make an exact statement about the future, but we do have lots of case studies now from the past that demonstrate that in terms of warming and CO2, it's robust to those things. And I'm, I'm going to be turning to heat stress now with my focus uh, in just a moment. Um, and I want to motivate that very briefly, uh, again, by a paleoclimate example. So um, once upon a time when people were reconstructing past temperatures, the temperatures that used to be reconstructed from paleoclimate proxies indicated temperatures in the tropics that were, if anything, slightly cooler than today, even in much warmer worlds. And the fact that those temperatures were cool and the poles were warm led to a whole paradigm that dominated the field um, from the 80s all the way till about 2001, when Paul Pearson and his colleagues discovered that the paleoclimate proxy data that people were interpreting were fundamentally flawed. And since then, since about 2001, so for about 20 years now, the tropical temperature estimates for past warm climates have all gone up a lot. We now understand what was wrong with the, with the older data. There's new data that's come out, new reconstructions of tropical temperatures through time. And now we understand that while the tropics don't warm as much as the poles, so the, the tropical response to global warming is muted, compared to the poles, um, they still do increase and they increase substantially. This is just one particular uh, set of studies here on the left. Um, uh, Joost Freeling, uh, we, we published a paper together in uh, Science Advances at one point in time, a couple of years ago. And we reconstructed tropical temperatures in Nigeria through the, the warmest period of time in the past 65 million years. So it was a hot planet, and then there was a sudden release of greenhouse gases, uh, and the planet warmed up by about five degrees. And here we have uh, a tropical temperature record in Nigeria. So the ocean temperature was about 34 degrees C. Like I said, it was a hot planet, and then it became really hot. And then there was an abrupt warming. The tropical temperatures reached 37 degrees C. These are sea surface temperatures. 
Now, you know, your internal body temperature is 37 degrees C. If the ocean temperature is 37 degrees C, well, as I'll get to in a minute, this causes fundamental problems if you're warm blooded. And what's really interesting is that um, dinoflagellates, which are a kind of organism that live in the ocean, they cause red tide, if you're familiar with that. Uh, they, they die when temperatures reach 37 degrees C. And, and that's more or less actually what you see here is a, is a massive die off locally in, Ni in the Nigerian uh, Delta um, as temperatures reach that really high value. Um, so that just a priori should have major implications for life that temperatures got that hot, even if it was for only 10 or 20,000 years, which geologically is short. <laughs> um, and sure enough, and I'll show you an example. So this, this little, the picture of the horse here, everyone see the picture of the horse. Um, well, the horse is pointing at another animal and that animal is the first horse, Eohippus. And these fossils are collected actually in um, Wyoming. So not in the tropics, but in about 50 degrees north latitude during this same period of time. And the early horses, when they first show up on the scene, they show up um, right before this warmest peak. So they show up down here and the original horses, when they show up in the fossil record, about the size of a dog, decent sized dog. And right when the warming is at its peak over here, they shrink and become cat sized dogs. So they, you know, they go from, you know, this big to like this big. And then as the planet cools off again, they abruptly go back to being dog sized horses. Now, if an animal, if a warm-blooded animal is under heat stress, this is exactly what you expect to happen. It's the square cubed law. So the smaller you get, the more surface area you have with respect to your body mass. The more surface area you have, the more heat you can lose. So, I mean, this is just a, kind of like a, a little bit of a bizarre paleoclimate example, but it probably is telling us something very real that the planet can push very hard, actually gets so hot that in the tropics, some things die. And even outside of the tropics, they're forced to literally evolve or die. So I find those kinds of examples compelling because they aren't just theories, they're backed by data. So it was really from thinking about past climates and how hot things got in the tropics that um, I, I had always been interested in that. And I was working on that. I gave a presentation at a Chapman conference. And after it, uh, Steve Sherwood said, wow, it sounds like it got really hot in the tropics in the past. I wonder if it can get so hot in the tropics that it actually causes problems for life. And it was based on, on him raising that point in our discussions that uh, we wrote a paper in uh, 2010 in PNAS where we addressed that question. Uh, and that has since then been one of the major uh, foci of, of my subsequent work. So, you know, uh, these days, heat stress and heat waves are on everybody's mind. And um, it's... Uh, it's a big deal and you can't open up a newspaper without thinking about it. You can't, uh, in some cases, walk down the street without feeling it. Um, when we started working on this in 2008 or so, uh, it was less, it was less really um, recognized that this would be a global problem that would only get worse. People were still thinking of these as individual events rather than if the world warms up, the whole world will eventually be in a heat wave if it warms up enough. Um, and again, I just want to always point out that people have been working on these problems for a very long time, and, and we owe a great debt to um, Haldane, who uh, acknowledges, so he was writing in 1905 and pointing out data from 1775, 
And he did a lot of crazy experiments on himself. Uh, Self-experimentation was a, was a big thing back then. Uh, and also he would take his, his son with him to do crazy experiments on themselves. Um, his son would go on to be one of the major people in the, the, the new synthesis in biology that happened uh, in the, later on in the 20th century. Haldane it went on to invent the gas mask, but he was really one of the first people to realize that it's the combination of heat and humidity combined in a certain way that we will call the wet bulb temperature that places a fundamental limit on humans and, and actually all mammals which I'll go into in a second. Um, but he concluded by doing experiments on himself, by climbing down into a, a, a mine and working with his son, like, oh, after a while, if it's the temperature and humidity or reach certain values, I can't work anymore. Um, and that value uh, for what we're going to call wet bulb temperature is about 31 degrees C. And what's that based on? Well, you know, so wet bulb temperature, you can think about it as the, the coolest temperature that can be approached uh, through evaporation. So you measure it by taking a, a regular old dry bulb thermometer, putting a wet sock around it and spinning it around your head until the, the thermometer has cooled maximally. So it's maximally evaporatively cooled. And the reason why that places a fundamental constraint on endotherms on warm blooded animals is because all of us generate heat internally through just metabolism. It's about 100 watts per meter. Well, it's about 100 watts. Um, and if you're on, on a, an exercise machine, you know, it could be 400 watts, right? So it's, it can be a lot of energy. And we have to dissipate. We have to lose that heat somehow. But if the wet bulb temperature is in a certain range, above a certain range, we can't lose heat through our skin anymore. So when the wet bulb temperature, so you're, if your internal body temperature is around 37 and has to be maintained near that, then your skin has to be cooler than 37. But if the wet bulb temperature is 37, or even it's less than that, something like between 31 and 35, you can't lose heat through your skin by sweating anymore. And as it turns out, this internal body temperature and these limits are not limited to just people. Actually, all mammals have, uh, if measured correctly in the right part of the body, about the same internal body temperature. And it's a, it's a fundamental response. You can't adapt to it on human timescales. You can't change this number. It's a physiological parameter for us. And you can test this on uh, baboons. So there's a little bit of a, a study here that I, I, I uh, reference where they take uh, baboons that live in very hot environments, they're very um, acclimated to their environment, put them under hot blankets and anesthetize them and see uh, how long they can be heated uh, before they die. And as it turns out, um, you can, you know, the kind of wet bulb temperature limits that we discussed are uh, the same for well acclimated baboons as the theoretical limit for humans. So we're really quite sure that there's a certain set of conditions that will um, kill animals. There's a large human health literature on this sort of thing, but they're not controlled experiments, thankfully. Um, so, you know, there's very generally speaking, fundamental limits. Uh, as humans, we lose 80 to 90% of our heat uh, through evaporation, through sweating. And we generate a certain amount when we work. And there has to be a balance in order to maintain a homeostasis between the amount that we generate and the amount that we lose predominantly by sweat. And then there may be additional inputs. Uh, for example, if you're in the sun and there's radiation, or if you're working in a bakery or something like that, there's more radiation thermal radiation. So you can take all these concepts and it leads you to um, the conclusion that if wet bulb temperatures get above certain values for more than about four or six hours, the human body cannot maintain homeostasis and it leads to heat stroke and eventually heat death. Now what that value is, you know, nobody wants to do those experiments, but definitely 35 uh, is very bad, but to be safe, 31 or 32 is, is where we should stop. 
So in our, in our original paper, we calculated for modern day what the maximum wet bulb temperature is, and you'll see it has, uh, so those are those values, the hot values are indicated in you know orange and yellowy colors. Um, you see if you're in the Sahara, what maximum wet bulb temperature in a given year is actually quite cool. It's like 19 degrees C because it's so dry. But if you're in India or Pakistan or Brazil, those values are actually substantially hotter. Right, but they're well below the limit. Now, this was in 2010, and we have better understanding. And there are more recent studies indicating that at least some of the time, maybe it's for an hour, some specific places are approaching 31 degrees C or a little bit higher than that for brief periods of time. So we may be closer to the limit than uh, was originally in this paper, but I don't think we're that much closer. I think in terms of conditions that last for long enough to cause negative health impacts, we're still pretty far away from, from the limit. And this was a purely theoretical study. We weren't doing this for practical purposes at the time. We we're just like, what if? What if the world gets three degrees hotter? What about five? What about 10? What about 15? And so what we found was once warming got about global mean surface temperature about more than 10, very bad things started happening. So everywhere that you see that's this like light purple color, um, light tan to purple, is uh, above the thermal limit. And so eastern half of North America, large parts of South America, North Africa, Saudi Arabia, Australia, India, parts of China, Southeast Asia. Um, so in those places, any mammal that's outdoors doing anything uh, will die in hours, okay? Now, that's with 10 degrees or more warming. That's a huge number. It's unlikely to happen. Um, but the, the problem is, or I mean, as a scientist, the good thing, and as a human, the bad thing is that it scales. Right, so we developed a very simple scaling relationship that, again, has proven to be reproduced in other studies uh, where if you know what the global mean surface temperature is, the uh, maximum wet bulb temperature and the area of the planet that is under high wet bulb temperatures just scales linearly with tropical temperatures and with a slope of 0.75, but also linearly with global mean surface temperatures. So for every degree of warming we get, things get worse. And there's a good chance that we will avoid, you know, very good chance, 10 degrees of warming and this kind of collapse of, of all endothermic life systems. Um, but we will run into large practical problems well before that limit for the, for the perfect warm-blooded mammal. Um, so if you wanna get, more empirical, then you have to do carefully controlled studies. This is one of my favorites where um, this is just one of them. It's, this is done by the military. It's done in ergonomic centers. It's done in health centers. It's, um, but, you know, you, you essentially force people to do exercises in a hot room. Well, you don't force them to. You ask them very nicely um, to do exercises in a hot room and see how long they can go as a function of temperature and humidity. And uh, this is one such study, there are many. And what you find uh, is that the wet bulb temperature is really the key thing. So uh, this is how long people can work. Each one of these is, a, is an individual and they're, they're running on a ex exercise machine. Uh, whoops. Uh, and the bottom number is the dry bulb temperature, regular temperature, and the numbers above it are wet bulb temperature. And you see that people can run for an hour on a, on a you know, running machine in 40 degree heat, no problem, as long as the wet bulb temperature is low. But when wet bulb temperature gets above about 35 or something, even light running becomes impossible. And for heavy exercise, heavy running, the threshold is more like 31 for wet bulb. And they, they fit a nice little regression, which you can see here. Um, 
and you know this is not quite wet bulb this is this is a an approximation but the the numbers don't work out to be too much different if you just do it with wet bulb and you see this cliff in in the ability to work where it goes from most people can work to almost nobody can work and it happens in a very specific range of values this sort of thing is very widely reproduced in many studies. The exact shape of the curve differs, which is important. How you measure it differs. The best way that we know of to measure it is with something called wet bulb globe temperature, where you measure the dry bulb temperature, the wet bulb temperature, and the radiative load um, and the wind speed. And that way of doing it is the best approximation to understanding uh, how to inform human health. Uh, it's complicated. I'll, I'll skip over some of the details there, but I, I'll just say that when people have tried to estimate this, and this, again, this is an earlier study, and I would say we have maybe improved ones these days, but the take-home point is the same. Uh, in this study, they were analyzing how the ability of humans to do labor would change as a function of scenario and time going into the future. And uh, so, no impact on labor would be up here, 100% labor capacities. People are all functioning at their maximum potential capacity. And you see that even for today, uh, this study indicated that, that people were only working about 95% of what they could. So heat stress was already an issue for them. But what they then showed is that for a large emission scenario, the ability globally of people to do labor drops off a cliff. And this is not because they're dying. This is because, you know, as I showed you initially, people, their physiology regulates, down-regulates them. They, you have to do less labor or you die. And so your body just says, stop working so hard when you get too hot. Um, so again, there will be details about how this is calculated, which are important, uh, but the general picture is we really need to be thinking about how high heat stress conditions will affect the ability of people to go about their daily lives outside, first without dying, but short of that, their ability to, to make a living, to go out and get water, to have a job. And then what the downstream impacts of that will be on societies and economies. And that's where a lot of my research now lies. Um, we can calculate things like this, like let's pick the hottest heat wave that anybody would have experienced in their lifetime today and say, what fraction of the year will that be in the future for a, a high emission scenario? And that hottest heat wave, in other words, the hottest three-day period you might ever have experienced in your life. Well, you know, if you're in India, that becomes three months. That becomes basically uh, a whole season. If you are uh, in uh, the Philippines, it becomes almost the whole year. The hottest heat wave you have experienced becomes just climatology. Um, and this is true in large parts of essentially the hotter, humid regions, the, the, um, not the arid parts of the subtropics, but the, the humid parts of the subtropics and tropics. This essentially becomes months of the year. So this should be, you know, deeply disturbing, whether you're thinking about health consequences and death, but, but maybe about how is this going to imp impact the ability of people to make a living where for months out of the year, they really can't work. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, this thread has been followed up in a number of studies, and you know, I was really happy when uh, Vimal wanted to kind of study the implications of, of this kind of thinking. Uh, regionally in India, and you know, it's kind of amazing to see how important this was, and, and the recognition from this study that um, irrigation, which is most people think of as a good thing because you are allowing the land surface to evapotranspire, which cools it. So, so we usually think of irrigation and adding water to a system as uh, making it more livable, 
And we definitely showed that. So, so it was a very nice study showing uh, what you can see in, in uh, panel D, uh, for example, that, that the, the high temperatures, air temperatures, are really decreased by adding irrigation. It's the blue parts in the, the diagram. But the problem is if heat stress is actually a combination of heat and humidity, adding water might not be a good idea. And that's what's showing up in, in panel F, that you can actually, by adding water, you can decrease the temperature of the air, but you can increase its wet bulb temperature. So you may decrease dry heat stress and increase wet heat stress by doing this. And I think a lot more work needs to be done on this because it has implications for green roofs, for uh, a whole bunch of, of mitigation measures that people have proposed for dealing with heat stress and the devil will be in the details. So a lot more work needs to go into this. In, um, in the work that we published uh, in 2020, John Bujan and I showed that with a slightly more refined and multi-model uh, approach than in the Dunn paper uh, earlier, that there could be for large warmings, you know, huge changes in labor capacity, uh, especially in the tropics, not so much in high latitudes. But the metric that we were using was really an approximation to the one that should be used. Um, I'll just skip that one. In, in more recent work, uh, uh, this group, uh, my, you know, my group, and in conjunction with my new student, Chin Chin Kong, uh, and um, the GTAP uh, group and, and Tom Hurdle's group at Purdue uh, have been doing a much more refined and advanced set of projections for what the labor and economic impacts will be. Uh, and I just, this is kind of preliminary work, but I just want to give you a flavor for it. Um, this is largely being conducted, uh, conducted by Wajia Saeed. Um, and uh, this is using a, a model that I don't understand. <laughs> uh, it's the, it's a, it's an economic model, which is not what I do, but I've been training my students to use those and, and I've been working together with that group of people, because I'm really interested in sustainability and the SDGs. And you can really only do that credibly if you're thinking through what's going on in with real people on the ground. So this is all value added to me. It's not something that I do. Um, so you know, my part in this is to work on the climate projections and to work with Chin Chin to uh, estimate the heat stress and the labor capacity loss. But then that information is put into a global economic and trade model, grid by grid, sector by sector, and for a whole variety of scenarios and to work out what the economic impacts are. But it is... Uh, a dynamic model. So there are changes that happen within the model um, that are, you know, uh, respond to these forcings. And when we start looking at that, um, you know, again, 65 sectors, 137 regions, different labor types, and uh, all of this economic modeling is very well calibrated. And the data inputs are very good on the economic side. So um, I'm, I'm, and on their end, it's, this is very solid work, all empirically verified. Uh, and we are now providing not just uh, simplifications to wet bulb globe temperature, but really the, the best possible approximation to its true value uh, calculated with temperature, humidity, wind, solar radiation, uh, pressure all included, which has not actually been included in any of these studies of the future before. So we like to think that at least right now, this is sort of a best in class approach. Um, and I'll just show you one or two results. Um, so for a three degree global warming, this is the change in labor capacity broken out country by country. Um, and in many countries, it's, it's not a big number, but obviously in some countries, uh, it's uh, a huge number. I mean, you're talking about drops in labor capacity, uh, headline numbers that are, you know, five, six, seven, eight degrees. Uh, but then when you start breaking it down sector by sector, 
uh, the sectoral impacts, uh, you know, within each sector, they can be huge. Um, and so you can see that here. So this is say uh, agriculture versus construction. And um, so just for example, in India, there will be a massive effect on construction, the construction industry, um, which as a, as a climate modeler, I could kind of like guess that somehow, like, oh yeah, they work outside. It's probably heavy labor outside. It's going to suck. Um, but, you know, with this kind of analysis, you can put like numbers on it, error bars and dollar signs, which I think uh, can be very uh, useful when discussing and guiding policy. But obviously every part of the world has a different response and it will vary a lot. And, you know, like I was saying, you know, you can start putting numbers that, you know, money on this. So where uh, the impact just due to reduction in labor, due to heat stress, and then the trade flows and all the changes associated with it ends up being something like 3% of GDP in India for a three degree warming. So, uh, and, you know, every country, of course, has um, some sort of impact. In some cases, like Canada, it's negligible. Um, but in the humid tropics to subtropics, these are all large numbers. So, um, you know, I, I cut my talk and I went over time, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, want to get across just a couple of points. You know, the, the broad one is that you can look in the past where we have data, even if it's uncertain data, to inform the future. What we've learned from that is climate sensitivity is not low. It's moderate to high. And I think that's robust. It can change. And the way it looks like it changes, the warmer it gets, the higher the sensitivity, which is bad. There are no tropical thermostats. There's nothing that's just going to magically keep the tropics from warming in the, in the future. And they will therefore get hotter and more humid, um, which will have major implications for heat stress in the tropics and the subtropics. The good news is I think the monsoon's safe, but uh, I've only studied one small part of the problem. Uh, but <clears throat> the impact of heat stress on humanity uh, and also on natural systems <coughs> is likely to be huge. Uh, it is definitely something that we can prevent the, the largest increases, but we are going to have to figure out how to adapt to and mitigate the effects of heat stress over uh, a, a wide a wide part of the planet, including where many people live. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for this nice talk. It was indeed very informative. And I'm sure everybody must have learned a lot of things from this. Thank you very much. And uh, that's all for today. Thank you for your time. And uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you very much and have a good night. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.